All right, well, good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many people here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ruben Rose Redwood. I'm an associate professor of geography at the University of Victoria and also the current chair of the uh, Committee for Urban Studies, which puts on the City Talks. Uh, and it's really my, uh, my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to welcome you all to the first lecture uh, in the City Talk series for fall 2013. Um, as many of you already know, the theme for uh, the series this fall is Religion and the City. Uh, and it's also co-sponsored uh, by UVic's uh, Center for Studies in Religion and Society. Now in the spring, uh, not to get too far ahead of myself, uh, but in the spring uh, we'll be shifting focus uh, with the theme of security and the city. Uh, and I assure you that there will be more details on the website, uh, thecitytalks.ca, uh, in the near future. I should also note that uh, this year's City Talks um, have been supported by a grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, as well as a number of departments and faculties at, at UVic. Uh, and I'd particularly like to thank a uh, former member of the Committee for Urban Studies, Kevin Walby, uh, for really taking the lead to secure funding for this year's uh, lecture series. Uh, Kevin uh, has left us to go off to, uh, to the University of Winnipeg, but we really appreciate uh, all his efforts. Lastly, I'd like to thank the Legacy Art Gallery for really providing such a wonderful space for uh, for the City Talks here in downtown Victoria. So with that being said, I'd like to uh, now introduce uh, Vincent Gornall, who uh, will be uh, coming to the stage to introduce tonight's uh, speaker. Um, and for those of you who don't know uh, Vincent, he's currently a graduate student in the Department of History at, at the University of Victoria, as well as a fellow uh, in the Center for uh, Studies in Religion and Society. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, um, Vincent, we'll take the stage. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Ruben, and thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to see another packed house for this series. Um, before I introduce our honored speaker tonight, um, I'd like to uh, announce three projects the, the City Hogs is partnering with. Um, in partnership with the local public library, every month I will be running a book club um, based on some of the writings of several of the speakers this term. Um, I will also be leading a series of city walks to go along with the city talks to engage people in various themes of each of the lectures in a very local environments. So we'll be taking people around to various sites locally um, and exploring how they relate to the themes in each of the lectures. The first one, following Paul's talk, will be on Saturday, October 1st. So not this coming Saturday, but the Saturday after. You can find details about each of these projects at the City Talks website or on the City Talks Facebook page. They'll be posted in the next few days. Um, the, that website is thecitytalks.ca. Now I have the pleasure and honor of introducing tonight's speaker, Paul Bremida. He is the director of the Center for Studies in Religion and Society at the University of Victoria and a renowned scholar of religion in various aspects of religion in Canada. He's currently working on um, religion secularization in Canada, as well as leading several research projects and finding out various interesting things. As a former student of Paul's and as a current fellow at the Centre, and as an urbanist who's really interested in vital aspects of what happens in our cities, including religion, I'm excited to hear what Paul has to say tonight and to invite him out of the stage. Thank you. Jeez, it's like it's a church or something, <laughs> or an art gallery. So uh, this is a bit of a weird uh, setup. I'm not used to having my, my uh, pictures behind me, but I'll do my best. Uh, thank you, where's Vincent, where'd he go? There he is. Thank you for that introduction, that's very, that's very lovely. Uh, I think that was your first introduction ever, right? So way to go. Thank you. I, it's the first of many, congratulations. <laughs> um, 
I was given a, a choice of who would introduce me, and I, I thought of uh, Vince right away because uh, I see him quite a bit and have seen him quite a bit for the last few years uh, in class or uh, around the center. So it's been, been nice to be here. Um, I'd also thank, like to thank Kevin Walby, who was who was mentioned earlier, and Jordan Stanger Ross, who couldn't be with us tonight because he's he's getting over a cold. Um, uh, they've really helped put this uh, series together. Um, as uh, Ruben mentioned, this is the first of four uh, lectures on the issue of religion uh, in the city. The next three speakers, one is from uh, Toronto and two are from Montreal. They're colleagues of mine and they are urbanists of various persuasions. Um, one is an anthropologist, one is a political scientist, and the other one is a religious studies scholar. So I think you're going to really um, enjoy uh, what they have to, to share with you. Now, what I really want to do tonight is kind of lay the groundwork for the kinds of conversations I want us to have uh, over the next uh, four lectures. And I think what's important for us to do as a community is to sort of begin to make sure that when we think about religion in Canada, in, and really when we mean that, when we say that, we really mean religion in the city, because uh, most of the data is, is focusing on, on cities. I want to make sure that we kind of have a common um, empirical framework uh, in mind for what's happening to religion in Canada, because there are some very uh, dramatic changes uh, underway. Um, now, the, the general structure for this evening is perhaps a bit unusual. Instead of me speaking for an hour and then you guys getting really tired and then pretending to, to be engaged in a conversation, what we're going to do is I'm only going to talk for, I think, 25 minutes or so, so that you'll all have, have fresh uh, minds when you come to the next section. And the next section is going to be responses from six community members. Um, responses to some of the things I'm, I'm talking about. And then we'll have a probably half an hour or so period of uh, community conversations. We have those kind of three, three sections of uh, this evening. Um, so here are the basic uh, issues I want to address tonight. First, what kind of basic changes are we seeing in uh, religion in Canada? Especially, I'm really looking at from about 1991 on, okay? So the last uh, roughly uh, 30 years. How might these changes uh, affect our societies, especially our urban settings, in the, in the near future? Because I think uh, big changes are occurring. I think probably in 500 years, they're going to say, wow, I wonder what it was like to live in around 2013. Because boy, those people must have really knew they were in the middle of this huge change. Actually, you don't really know that, right? Because we're kind of fish in water. But I'm, well, I'm going to try to slow the conversation down a little bit so we kind of notice the changes we're going through. I want to also ask what insiders might feel or think about the changes uh, they're witnessing, if they are in fact witnessing any changes. And then finally, uh, in the third section of, of this evening, I want us to all talk uh, together about the changes that you're experiencing in, in whatever uh, part of the public world you come from. Now, we have uh, six guests, friends, colleagues, uh, students of mine. Um, the first is Dr. Siobhan Chandler, who is a research fellow at the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. Um, I call her an expert on the spiritual and not religious movement because, in fact, if there's anybody doing any serious research on religion in Canada and they wanted to look at the SBNR cohort, that's what we call them, the SBNR cohort, Siobhan is really one of the only people who's done any significant work on this, this phenomenon or this cohort. So we're very, very fortunate to have her with us in Victoria and especially to have her with us uh, at the Center. Um, Lynn Greenoff, from, who is a member of the Jewish community and also a teacher within that community. Ali Hamado, who is a member of the Muslim community and also a student of mine now, though perhaps he regrets that by the uh, second, second week of September. Um, Father Dean Henderson, who is the uh, Roman Catholic chaplain at the University of Victoria. Reverend Logan McManamy, who is an Anglican priest, he's at, uh, is a dean of the cathedral at Christ Church Cathedral and also a fellow at the center uh, right now. We're, we're kind of stealing him from Christ Church for the next uh, little while. And finally, uh, Alan Saunders, a uh, minister at the United uh, Church, um, Metropolitan United Church. And um, I, as, as you see, I organized that um, alphabetically. I was thinking historically, thematically, but it just gets complicated and people's feelings get hurt. So I just did it alphabetically. Um, okay, now before we talk, let's talk about why it's hard to talk about this topic, okay? Um, some of you probably heard the news uh, when this happened. Uh, so once upon a time, Canada had a very um, well-respected uh, census um, procedure where every 10 years they asked people what religion they were, okay? And they asked that 
It was, and it was a mandatory census, okay? So that was actually pretty useful in, in many, um, many societies around the world. Uh, looked upon us with great envy for the kind of data we were able to get, not just about, about religion, but about uh, many things. Um, I don't know, six or eight or 12 or a couple of minivans full of people in probably somewhere in Alberta complained about this because they said it was invasive. Uh, and lo and behold, soon thereafter, the, the survey was no longer mandatory and it changed from being a mandatory survey to being a voluntary survey, okay? Uh, and really the data that you get from a mandatory census versus a, a voluntary survey, it's quite different kinds of data. So right away, I want to just flag that as, as one of the inherent problems with the kind of, uh, kind of things I'm going to talk about tonight. Having said all that, um, one of my friends and colleagues from the University of Ottawa, Peter Beyer, who some of you uh, probably have heard of, um, he's one of the big number crunchers for religion in Canada. And so when any of us who study religion in Canada have a kind of an empirical problem, we usually call Peter. and He's very, very generous with his, with his uh, tables. And so what Peter did is he, he used uh, tables from 1991 when there was a mandatory census, 2001 when there was a mandatory census, and then after the couple of minivans of people in Alberta complained, uh, 2011 when there was a voluntary survey, okay? Um, and, you know, there are some weird features of, of the uh, National uh, Household Survey, um, but Peter's impression, and I think he's right, is that the, the trajectories that we see in the previous several uh, censuses um, are continued in the survey. So his sense is that the data that we're getting uh, for 2011 is, is not too bad. Although there are a few weird spots that just don't quite make sense, like what happens to the number of Pentecostals. So for example, between 91 and 2001, the number of Pentecostals went down, I think about 15%. This was a source of a great uh, surprise to many Pentecostals who saw their churches growing, right? Um, and then between 2001, when there was a census in 2011, when there was this voluntary survey, uh, the numbers went up about 30%, right? So you get these weird, as Peter calls them, kind of gyrations in the data, but for the most part, his impression is that it's, is that it's, uh, it's okay. There's a focus here on self-reporting and kind of macro shifts, okay? So we're not talking about fine-grained life story uh, in ethnographic kind of research. That's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking really about the biggest possible picture you can, you can get on what's happening in society. So it's valuable, but it, it, there are some limitations to these kinds of um, self-professed uh, identities. And then finally, the last empirical challenge is really a challenge of ethnicity or nationalism, I guess I would say. So for example, um, if you go to Quebec, uh, large, large numbers of people continue to say that they're Catholic. Uh, but it may not necessarily correlate to um, sort of deeply held convictions or loyalty to the church or going to confession or any of the things we often associate with being Catholic. In many cases, especially in Quebec, there's this close uh, correlation between people's sense of ident identifying with the, the name Catholic and identifying with being Quebec Québécois, especially the Francophone Québécois. It's not unlike what you find some, in some cases uh, in Victoria and in other parts of the very, very English parts of Canada, where there is this kind of loyalty to Anglicanism that um, in some sense skews the data because many people again feel kind of cultur culturally uh, Anglican. Um, so those are, those are things that, you, that we need to bear in mind. Uh, the, the data, especially I think on Catholics, is uh, a bit skewed. We had a sociologist here from, from Durham um, for about uh, four or five months and um, he did this interesting study on what happens to people's religious sensibilities during their four years at university. And so he looked at, a, he looked at uh, all the survey data and he conducted his own survey in, in the UK on this phenomenon. And, and of Catholics, he said, well, somebody asked him a question, well, what happens to the Catholics in these four years? And what happens to them after they leave, they leave uh, university? And his response was that Catholics don't become anything else, they just become lapsed Catholics, right? But when someone from Stats Canada comes to them and says, what's your religion? They'll say they're Catholic, right? Because they have, there's a, a deeper kind of, I would say, ethnic, um, in many cases, or cultural uh, affinity to, the, to that uh, title. Okay, now, I, so uh, Peter um, gave me this massive table full of, like, I don't know, hundreds of numbers. My, some of my undergraduate students are here today, and, and you've seen this table. It's just, it'll give you an instant migraine. So what I've done is I've tried to 
take Peter's tables, uh, again, that have, that have data from 91, 2001, and 2011, and kind of distill them into, uh, into a few different tables that I think will kind of tell a particular story. And I've tried to make them somewhat more attractive than Peter's massive table, which takes up a couple screens, actually. So here's the first change of three I want to, I want to identify. We're seeing, over the last uh, couple decades, declines in, in liberal forms of religion and growth in conservative communities. Okay, I just want to sort of talk you through this slide. You, you don't, we're not, there's not going to be any quiz, and you don't have to pay attention to every number. But I kind of just want to highlight uh, a few of the numbers. So you see here, there's really only been a decline of 1% um, between 2001 and 2011 in the Catholic numbers. Um, this, I think, is probably uh, understating the uh, reality. Certainly, many of my Catholic colleagues across the country suggest that's the case. Uh, and I think what we're seeing here is somewhat of one of those uh, examples of the, uh, the skewing effect that kind of ethnic and national identification has, especially in Quebec. The, the really, uh, if, you, if you're a Christian, especially if you're a liberal Protestant, uh, the really bad news is here. Uh, so these, especially these churches here, United Anglican and Lutheran, they have gone down in this decade, 22, for the United, for, uh, sorry, 29 and a half for the United Church in that 10 year period, 20% of the Anglicans and 21 for the Lutherans, okay? Um, so those are significant uh, declines for some of these churches that have been around for uh, a long time in Canada. This conservative Protestant number is a number that Peter and I kind of put together where these are kind of a capital E evangelical churches, you might say, and other churches which um, don't get grouped by Stats Canada in that way, but, but really, uh, for all intents and purposes, are uh, members of all the, the, this conservative Protestant category. So you see considerable growth in the last uh, several days, okay? So tw about 20% in the, in the past, uh, in the past uh, 10 years. Um, and this, I, I think I mentioned here, this, these Pentecostal numbers, this is Peter's impression is this is a kind of a, a wobble or a, a peculiar quirk of the data because it's, it's not too clear what we ought to make of, of, of that, uh, that figure. Um, the last two, this is very interesting, I look at the size of these increases, 154%, 110% in the last two uh, studies. Um, so. What's important to bear in mind there is that these are Christians not otherwise specified. Okay, that's what the, that term means. Um, massive growth in this category. Still, the numbers are not so big, right? 1.5 million. But they're growing rapidly because these are people who are kind of unchurched. That is to say, they call themselves Christians. They're not necessarily conservative Protestants, but they're not necessarily, you know, joiners. They're not, they're not part of A or B uh, church. Now, I want to contrast this with the second set of changes that, that the media was just all over as soon as, they, as soon as these figures came out. Many of you will have heard stories that revolved around this figure because frankly, when people saw that figure uh, in, the, in the 2001 uh, census, they kind of just, well, frankly, freaked out, okay? And um, the idea that all these non-Christian traditions were almost doubling uh, in that 10 year period and may well continue to almost double was uh, you know, the source of great hand-wringing for many people in the national news media. Um, the number is still, when you add up all, yeah, Robert? Uh, some of us can't see the figures, you can sort of... Oh, you can't see the figures? Oh. Uh, so 128% for Muslims, between 91 and 2001, 89 for Hindus, 84 for Buddhists, and 88 for Sikhs, that's in a 10 year, 10 year period. Okay. Yeah. And the pattern more or less continues uh, in the most recent um, data. Um, but the, the thing to bear in mind about, you know, each of these numbers goes down, especially the poor Buddhists. I don't know what's going on there. Um, but uh, maybe some people have already achieved enlightenment. They don't need to uh, worry about titles and, you know, labels anymore. Who, who wants to be boxed in, right? But uh, it's largely a function of the fact that virtually all of this growth is from immigration, okay? And so the numbers uh, are, have, have remained relatively stable in terms of the new numbers of um, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, and Buddhists coming in. But the effect on, in terms of the growth, the percentage growth of the community, therefore, uh, is altered. Nonetheless, when you see those numbers compared to these numbers, you see what, you know, why there was so much ink spilled on this particular social change. Okay, the third social change 
and this is really one of the reasons I invited Siobhan, because one of the most dramatic changes, I think, and really this was kind of like the third set of stories. So the first set of stories was on what's happening to Christian Canada. The second set of stories was mostly on, wow, look at all the Muslims, because uh, the, the media was just obsessed with the Muslims. Uh, and the third set of stories was really, wow, look, look at all of these people, okay? This, the no religion category is in Canada quite large. It's about uh, 24 or 25%, okay? Massive and growing very rapidly. You look at, it was 12%, it was at 12% in 91 and 24% in 2001, okay? So I skipped over the 2001 figures uh, just to keep things uh, simpler, all right? Um, now, something to bear in mind here is that what I've done is, is I haven't given you 2001 figures, but I have given you the size of the growth of that community in that, in that uh, decade, okay? So in the last 10 years, just to put it in perspective, in the last 10 years, the no religion category grew by 3 million. And for those of you who think we have a massive number of people in Canada who call themselves atheists, you know, really, it's about 50,000 people. So there's more people in Oak Bay than there are atheists in, uh, in, in Canada. <laughs> Um, so, so the numbers the numbers are very small, but this category is a source of a great deal of discussion and debate among scholars of religion and sociologists, um, because it's kind of one of these big catch-all categories, right? It's not really clear what it means. Some people who are in fact atheists do end up saying they just have no religion, right? And these are people who actually say, "I am an atheist," on uh, on the National Household Survey or on the previous census forms. Um, so this, sometimes people say, well, this is kind of a way station, the no religion category. People are kind of passing through. Perhaps they'll return to Islam, Judaism, Christianity, whatever. Um, really, frankly, we don't really know yet. But this is a very dramatic, this is a very dramatic uh, shift in Canadian religion. Again, about 25%. Uh, it's hard to underestimate the significance of that for you know, what we think of when we think about Canada, and especially Canadian history. So let me just, let me just sort of summarize the highlights here, okay? Um, so again, what I've done is I've given you two columns separated by 20 years, okay? I haven't given you the column of the 2001 numbers because I just, I was feeling the, the whole thing was becoming a bit too numbery, all right? So, but what I've, what I've done is I've given you the difference between these, these two uh, census, these, these two surveys, and so you have here a fall from 83% of Canadians were Christian in 91 down to 67% in uh, 2011, okay? So a really, again, a massive, a massive shift. And to put it in, and put it in sort of human body terms, um, in the last, just the last 10 years, okay, not the last 20 years, but just the last 10 years, the people in the Christian category went down by almost 750,000 people. Again, a massive, massive uh, change. Muslims um, here from 253,000 in 91 to just over a million in this most recent uh, survey. And so the, the growth in the last, just in, again, just in the last 10 years is uh, 475,000. So, you know, the number of Jews has remained relatively flat, really only a loss of 500 people in the last, in the last uh, 10 years. But again, here, here is the big number here. This massive jump uh, by 3 million people in the no religion category, okay? So big changes. Now, um, just by way of wrapping up, I wanna talk about um, a couple of challenges. The first challenge that we face, or that these facts and figures might help us to understand or to think through a bit more clearly, is questions of space and place. So one of the things that interests urbanists, uh, obviously, is the, especially the kind of downtown core area and the kind of uh, the way people use public space and uh, religious space in those, in those cores. So one of the things that's likely to happen, certainly going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years, is a lot of churches are going to close or be amalgamated or be transformed uh, or be knocked down altogether. This is going to be very traumatic for a lot of people. There's just no question about it. Um, it's also going to really change the way our cities work because these huge spaces, which have been for so long used for one kind of purpose and have a, has a sort of symbolic function in the broader city, it's going to change dramatically. Many people are not going to recognize their, their cities in, in uh, 20 years. It's going to challenge, I mean, many of these places will be turned into, let's say, condos or other kinds of developments, which is going to be really uh, traumatic for some folks. 
if you live in Ope, where I live, where they have rules about, you know, the kind of post box you can have and, and so forth. It's going to be really a big, a big uh, jarring change for a lot of my neighbors when they see some of their churches closed and to be turned into who knows what, uh, condos and other sorts of things. So um, I think also one of the things we see um, likely to happen is a, a shift toward the suburbs for some of the newer um, communities that are growing very rapidly and can't necessarily afford to buy uh, a big space in downtown Victoria or Toronto or, or anywhere else. So by, you know, by necessity, they need to move out to the suburbs, okay? That is, in some sense, I think, kind of a loss for uh, many of us because it kind of decreases um, the ethnic diversity of the downtown area. If you're sort of farming out your, the, the places of worship of people who are mostly not white and mostly uh, immigrant, um, it's going to change uh, things. Really, when, when uh, religious communities are able to build in the downtown area, I think it's a, a real benefit for a, a culture to have that sense of uh, diversity uh, on the streets. It's really uh, quite a good thing. The next thing that we see is um, the potential for suburban kind of clustering. Many of you have been uh, through, or maybe even been to, the area of Vancouver, or outside Vancouver, uh, often called the Highway to Heaven, uh, where there are, it's kind of a special zone where they've allowed uh, all these religious um, buildings to be built. And so you have living next door to one another, you have Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs and various kinds of Christians, Asian, non-Asian. Um, there's, there's a Gurdwara, there is a... Uh, so it's just a tremendously diverse place. And uh, so that's an interesting kind of social experiment and there's been, there've been a ton of uh, PhDs and books written on Highway to Heaven, in case you're, in case you're interested. Um, so, this is, a, this is likely to be a pattern that we're going to see in the next while, not just in Vancouver, but in, in probably all big cities, where, where some kind of enterprising municipal leader is going to say, well, look, why don't we, all these folks have a kind of a common interest, they need cheap land, and they need to have big parking lots, and they need, they need to have a decent um, transportation, so make, let's, let's cluster all these folks together. And there are some real advantages to that, actually. I mean, there's something kind of um, fascinating about the, the highway to heaven area, um, there are tremendous tensions between the different religious groups. That is something which you don't normally hear about, unless you, you um, dig around a little bit. Um, but there were going to be tensions between them if they lived in downtown Victoria or Vancouver or Edmonton anyway, right? So anyway, this is just a, one, of the, one of the changes. Now the next um, challenge here, this is something that um, I'm working on right now. I'm working on a SHRC um, project right now on this, on this issue. So one of the things that um, religions, especially the established religions, and especially the Christian traditions have done uh, for Canadian society for a very long time is to offer a tremendous number of social services. Okay? What, you know, whether we're talking about soup kitchens or women's shelters or English as a second language or French as a second language uh, or temperance um, meetings or space for AA groups or whatever. Um, religious groups, and again, these are mostly uh, Christian groups because they've just been around longer, have offered a tremendous amount and have essentially carried a fairly significant burden for the state because they're doing this for free, they're, they're renting out their space or they're uh, letting out their space usually for free or for, for fairly cheap. Um, and it turns out that, you know, many of you are familiar with the, with the term the civic core. So it turns out there's about 6% of Canadians who are responsible for an inordinate number uh, or, or amount of the, the sort of social good, volunteer hours, numbers of dollars donated, and uh, civic participation of, of other sorts. There's actually a second um, part of that uh, civic cohort. If you look at the next 23%, so if you look at about the, the, the sort of 29% of people who, who give the most, that actually, that actually captures 87% of the hours, 78% of the dollars, and 73% of all civic participation, okay? And then, so which, that, these are almost all just interesting facts until you realize that when you look at what correlates to your involvement in this civic core, either in the 6% or in the other 23%, religion is one of the top three things that correlates. Age is the other, right? So being, uh, having the latitude to, to do this kind of work. But religion, involvement in a religious group or doing things out of religious uh, motivations, these are very strong uh, correlates to being in the civic core and certainly being in the 6%. So, our society really has relied on this core for a very long time, for lots of things. By the way, I, I don't want to be all, all rosy and kumbaya about this, because in fact, you know, we all know that 
the religious and the involvement of religious groups in uh, in sort of state objectives has not always been so good, frankly, right? Residential schools, uh, some of the most you know vehement opponents of the rights of women and gays and lesbians and so forth. So the involvement of religious communities in uh, talking with the state or in being involved in sort of broader public affairs has again not been so good uh, all around. Okay, however. They've also done these, these uh, pretty wonderful things too. And we've relied on this um, for a long time. And it, you know, it's not entirely clear just yet um, how big a contribution this is in terms of what's essentially the dollar figure of, of the contributions that religious communities are making to the broader society. That's one of the things I want to study in this, in this project I'm about to undertake. But I'm, I'm guessing, you know, my hunch right now is that the contribution is quite uh, significant. And so the loss of that contribution will also be quite significant. And I'm just kind of guessing that the government is not going to say, well, you know, look, uh, this Anglican or this Catholic or this United Church group is no longer offering these 46 services for free. Uh, so I'll tell you what, you know, we're going to pay some federal government worker $35 an hour to go in and, and do the soup kitchen. I'm kind of guessing that's not going to happen. And so it just seems to me that we need to think about, first of all, how, much, how many contributions are being made and what kind of... Uh, how the religious groups are kind of interpreting these these changes. Um, there's increased pressure on the people who do this volunteer work in the current climate because don't forget many of these groups were started when the family structure was different, the city structure was different, the whole kind of way we thought about um, our society was was different. There was usually a, a person at home. That person was usually or almost always uh, a woman, and the, you know life was much more affordable. Okay, so, but if you're a, a young family in Vancouver, you're very likely to have two people working. Um, and so there's a whole different set of, uh, of uh, dilemmas that our society faces, uh, given that we're in a new kind of uh, economic, uh, a new period of our economy. Um, and then the additional pressure, I think, is found in the data tables I've, I've already shown you, which is to say that many of these larger, older groups are, uh, are suffering extreme, extremely uh, severe losses. And that is likely to lead to the loss of um, many of these services for the broader society. Let me just end here with two scenarios, and I'll, I'll, I'll have the six folks come up. Um, the first scenario, really, is, uh, you know, for many people, this is kind of the, the end of the world as you know it scenario. Um, imagine the, uh, the meeting of neoliberal economics with a particular kind of banal narcissistic uh, anti-institutionalism and the culture of therapeutic individualism. Uh, leading one, one fears to a kind of a social crisis, a kind of a, a decline in the willingness of people to contribute so much money and time and square footage to helping people who aren't members of their own community. And therefore, I think, leading to a kind of a crisis in, in uh, community cohesion. But there's a, there's a different scenario too, which is to say that this kind of period that we're in, which we'll understand better in 500 years if, this, if our species is still around, that this kind of transition we're in the middle of might loosen up some of the institutional um, strictures that we've created for ourselves. And that loosening might allow for greater solidarity to be created between and among religious groups and non-religious groups. That is to say, state groups, but also uh, non-governmental organizations. And that loosening up of these kinds of tight, kind of tribal boundaries that we've created for ourselves between Anglicans and Jews and Muslims and so forth, the loosening up of these boundaries might enable people to face some of these social challenges, whether it's homelessness or drug addiction or whatever, uh, might allow us to face some of these social challenges together without the the you know the handcuffs of many of our uh, many of our identities. So I am going to uh, end there. Thank you, and then I am going to introduce first Siobhan Chandler. Um, so, what I, so what, what I did is I gave the six, the six respondents or speakers the PowerPoint presentation a few days ago and I said, you know, just come up and give me a, a three or so minute response or reflection to, uh, to what you've seen to these, to these uh, tables and to some of the basic problems that, um, that I've identified. And um, so first, Jovan is going to come up and then I will just, we'll just go in the order, what was the order? Uh, we'll go. Da, 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 da. There we go. We're just going to go alphabetically, okay? 
So Siobhan first and then, and then Lynn. And then after they're finished, um, we'll move the chairs up here. They'll face you and we'll have a kind of a broader conversation which I will, you know, lightly uh, moderate. Okay, Siobhan, go ahead. Welcome. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'll just move along quickly since three minutes is really not very long. <laughs> so first thing I want to do is just clarify the relationship between uh, this data about religious nuns, these, these people who say they have no religion, and people who are spiritual but not religious, which is really my area of specialization. So we do know from the data that about two-thirds of people who say they have no religion also say they believe in God. And about 58% of those same people will report that they have a deep connection with uh, the earth or with nature. And about one in five will say that they pray regularly. So we do know that being spiritual but not religious has some connection to being uh, saying you have no religion. So in my three minutes, what I want to talk to you about quickly is um, these scenarios, or they're not there now, that Paul outlined, um, you know, with a growth in spiritual but not religious, what kind of society might develop as a result of that. Um, in the best case scenario, it could lead to a greater uh, diversity, greater tolerance, some sorts of religious innovation. Uh, the worst case scenario, as many of you may know, is uh, allegedly that there's going to be social problems as a result of the growth in this cohort because they're not socially engaged in the same way, particularly as the religiously committed are. So what I want to do is just have you at the outset check three assumptions that you might have about what uh, being spiritual but not religious is all about. So the first of all is, uh, is this really not religion? Well, as a religious studies scholar, I have to say that I find this very problematic, this notion that spiritual but not religious is evolving to be something outside of religion. Uh, I would argue very definitely that it is a form of religion. It's a very non-traditional type of religion. We're not used to analyzing religion in this way. It doesn't fit into a little box. It's this massive cohort of seekers, of people doing all kinds of things that look a little different. They don't go to church. They're not embedded in institutions. And so how do we know that they're all spiritual but not religious? Uh, very basically, we know that there tends to be, in my research and research others have done, we can see a pattern. Uh, this pattern basically looks like uh, there's a, an interest in non-dualistic religious philosophies, particularly Buddhism. There's an interest in, in indigenous spiritual uh, cosmologies, so um, Wicca, uh, neo-paganism, and particularly uh, First Nations practices. We have a, a very big interest in personal development techniques, particularly those that can change uh, the, the idea that material reality can somehow be changed by what the mind is doing. Uh, a very broad interest in mystical practices from all the traditions. And then finally, I would say one of the hallmarks of spiritual but not religious is this interest in personal, or really this need to have personal experience of the divine. So this is very important as we move to the second assumption, which uh, one of the things spiritual but not religious seekers like to do is have a personal experience of the Godhead through their own um, more practices, and it can be really any kind of practice which leads to the sort of eclectic nature. But it also leads to this notion that this type of spirituality is very narcissistic because uh, seekers are turning within, and so there's this fear that, well, we've got this massive cohort of people who are now directing their attention inward, and so this is going to produce a type of social withdrawal, and these people are going to become, you know, atom or um, atomized, socially atomized, as we say. They're not going to contribute much. And this is a big fear about the growth of the not religious sector, particularly when we see the high levels of contribution from the religiously committed. So uh, what I would say about that is there's two things to note there. The first is that we have to carefully look at if somebody is getting a benefit from promoting a polemic like that, particularly religious groups who, uh, you know, we've seen in the charts that there is a decline in organized religion. And so some of these uh, religious groups, I think, this is my particular opinion, are kind of trading on the potentially narcissistic tendencies of these new religious practices to bolster their own credibility as in, look, we're institutional, we're historical, we're doctrinal. We've got this weight and integrity that's lacking in this other stuff. So when we hear that polemic, just to be on guard that somebody's not benefiting from that representation. 
Um, the other main factor there, too, is it ignores the fact that we all live now in a very individualistic culture. So it's not just these seekers that are individualistic, but really our culture more broadly, any capitalist society really has quite an indiv uh, in, uh, individualistic uh, population. So the third thing then is if we've got these potentially narcissistic individuals and they're going to be socially withdrawn because they're not engaging their turning with them, do we actually have any data that proves that that is the case? And I would say that we have almost no data showing that that is actually the case. Uh, for my doctoral dissertation, I actually collected some data on this topic, and it, it's very hard to do direct comparisons with the religiously committed, but I would throw these little things out there. Uh, the first is that the rates of donation to environmental organizations amongst the religiously unaffiliated are very high. It's about 47% of the people I interviewed gave money to charity environmental organizations versus about 8% of Canadians. Um, the other little tidbit of data, and I admit it is a tidbit, uh, is the use or, or the purchase of organic um, goods and services. So whereas many Canadians will tell you, uh, they have data that says, uh, you know, 60, 70 percent of Canadians say they're interested in eating organic food, uh, but actually it only translates to about 5 percent. This data may be a bit old now. So only 5 percent of Canadians actually purchasing that, whereas amongst the spiritual but not religious that I looked at, the figure was 20 percent. So we do see different types of social behaviors and we need to have an, a new framework or different frameworks for examining their political engagement style. So I'm gonna leave it there, thank you. I hope I haven't gone over my three minutes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight is Simchat Torah. It's a festival of rejoicing, of the giving of Torah. And I can probably guarantee that there's more people here than at the synagogue tonight, which is its own interesting statement, I think, about the discussion we're having this evening, the fact that I'm here. <laughs> yes, interesting validation. No, no, it's fine. So I, I think that there are many, many questions since Paul asked me to be on this panel. I've had a number of conversations with other Jews that I know. Uh, what are the questions, what are the pushes for Jews in this form, of, in this type of study? And I think one of the questions that comes up for all of us is, what was the question that was asked? Because many, many, many Jews are not religiously affiliated per se, but are defiantly Jewish, whether they're culturally Jewish, secularly Jewish, whether they define themselves as culinary Jews. It's a very important identification. And, and I, I, I mean, it sounds a bit funny, but for many of us, food is the source of who we are where our identity, where our identities are embedded. So I use culinary Jewish, but it's, it, it speaks of a familial identity that I think isn't necessarily picked up in a census or a national household survey. Uh, interestingly, we're here in Victoria, we're here in the Legacy Gallery, and one of the legacies the Jewish community has left Victoria still in use is Congregation Emmanuel Synagogue up at Pandora and Blanchett, a synagogue that I was affiliated with for many years. Uh, it is historically important in Canada as the only synagogue that's been in continuous use since it was opened in 1863. And it has gone through many of the meanderings that you describe, Paul, in your introduction. Uh, in the 50s, going down to 10 to 12 families who really struggled to keep that synagogue open. And there have been many conversations between those years, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, sell the building, keep the building, move to the suburbs. What are we gonna do? What can we sell it for a dollar? What's that gonna buy? Right? So there are many, many conversations about what is our legacy. And for Jews, the legacy is not really so much about the building. 
we have been, as a people, in exile uh, for thousands of years. And we have had to recreate ourselves. We have had to redefine who we are. We don't live as biblical Jews uh, anymore. We have been through striations and striations. And here we are in a modern age. Siobhan, you mentioned you know, that all of us, uh, whatever our religious domination, denomination, our religious affiliation, how we identify ourselves, we cannot escape that modern or postmodern uh, atomization. Uh, and each of us, as, as Jews, chooses every day who we are as a Jew and how we are going to proceed with that identity. Are we going to affiliate with a synagogue? Are we going to be observant? Are we not? And I think one of the biggest challenges for Jews today is that we are post-Shoah, we're post-Holocaust. And I just want to read one small quote from David Kramer. David Kramer is a conservative Jew uh, who's doing some very important writing. And, and he talks about the transition of an oral trend, trend, tradition into a written tradition and some of the problems that ensue when you freeze a tradition. And I think for many, many Jews today, we are in a frozen state. So let me just read this quote quickly. He writes, the passage of literary work from exclusively oral to written oral transmission is profoundly transformative. What was once present as direct address and shaped invariably to suit the needs of the moment, as these took shape in the interaction of speaker and audience, is now deprived of the fluid form which constitutes its social reality. A tradition once reformulated and changed with each performance is now stabilized and objectified in a form which exerts a powerful control over future performances of readings. So what was formally authored at each recitation must now be reproduced as it is written. And so what does this mean in actual fact on the ground? It means that many Jews today no longer learn their tradition with their families. Their great grandparents, their grandparents were all murdered. So where are they learning their tradition? They're learning their tradition from books. They're learning their tradition from texts. They're going to classes. They're, that has transformed a people, I would suggest, uh, into a state of fear. And I say that having heard very, very often, but what if I don't do it right? I don't speak Hebrew. I don't know how to do this. I didn't learn this. And so we have now, we're now encountering a people who are learning from texts in a frozen fashion having lost those generations who would have passed on the tradition to us in an oral form. And there's lots more to say about that. Thank you very much. First, um, I would like to um, start with the Islamic greeting, Assalamu Alaikum, which translates to Peace be upon you. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Ramadat for allowing me to be here to share with you uh, information about my faith and community. Um, as Dr. Ramadat uh, um, mentioned that the growth for rates for Muslims are quite alarming and some people are freaking out <laughs> about these numbers. Yes, definitely, uh, these numbers are increasing and increasing more, and uh, which create a lot of uh, challenge for Muslims to cater for this increase. Um, I came here to Victoria 20 years ago, and we were only about 50 Muslims. Uh, we didn't have a mosque. As a matter of fact, we rented a, a townhouse, and we used to pray in a, a living room of a townhouse. And our Friday prayers 
uh, were um, done at the University of uh, Victoria Interfaith Chapel. A uh, few years after, in 1996, uh, we noticed that there is a dire need for um, a mosque. As a matter of fact, uh, Muslim life uh, revolve around the mosque and uh, people move to a place where there is a mosque uh, where they can observe their uh, five daily prayers or at least whatever they can uh, observe if they are working or can't attend all the five daily prayers at the mosque. Um, with the help of uh, uh, God first and then the community and uh, those who are generous, we were able to uh, purchase two properties located on Quadra, just across from Crystal Pool. Uh, two old houses. Um, it's uh, one of them converted to a, a prayer space for uh, men and the other one for uh, women. Uh, they served us for about, I would say, um, 10 years and then there is a great demand for a bigger place and uh, the community came together and um, uh, redeveloped the whole site. And uh, we have now about 2,000 uh, Muslims in Victoria. And this increase definitely uh, creates a lot of challenges uh, for us. The growth of, um, in the numbers of Muslims uh, in, in Victoria or in Canada in general uh, brought a lot of uh, positive changes to the people. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it made Islam um, a bigger target to those who oppose it. Uh, this, uh, this is apparent uh, in the global issues um, surrounding Muslims, such as Muslims being labeled as terrorists, um, oppositions toward women wearing um, head and face covering and so on. And this grow, uh, growth, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, um, create challenges for our future uh, generation, uh, catering for uh, children and youth. Uh, there is a dire need now in Victoria with this large growth in, in the Muslim population uh, for an Islamic school, uh, which is our next step to have an Islamic school like the ones on the mainland. And the mainland, uh, all these services are catered uh, to, to uh, Muslims uh, all ages, all, all age groups and men, women, children and youth. And uh, uh, as you know, Islam is, is a comprehensive uh, religion and is valid for all time and all places. Uh, we have to, um, as, as Muslim community here, we have to cater uh, to, to these um, uh, new and future generations, as uh, Dr. Bramadad mentioned, that immigration is one of the uh, uh, reasons for the increase of, of the Muslim population. Also, um, uh, fertility rates also contribute to that. Um, as an old member here in, the, in, in Victoria, um, every year I sign a, a new passport application for newborns uh, quite often, which we have about uh, 20 new babies at least every year born here in Victoria. Um, basically, that's um, all what I would like to share in these three minutes. I thank you all and um, may God bless all of you. Thank you. So, um, Father Dean Henderson, a chaplain at the University of Victoria, one of uh, nine. Uh, I don't feel like I'm a specialist in any way at all. I'm a generalist. Uh, I've been downtown in all kinds of capacities uh, for a number of years. I assist at St. Andrew's Cathedral. Uh, I've worked at Mount St. Mary Hospital just down in Fairfield of Quadra. Um, and uh, occasionally I'm uh, on the street, just hanging out on the street on Friday afternoons. Uh, the first thing I, I thought I'd say is that uh, I looked at these, these statistics and I thought, goodness gracious, 40% of Canadians want to identify as Catholics. That's incredible. <laughs> Fantastic. I wouldn't think anybody would want to identify with a Catholic church. So I just thought this is really a, a positive thing. It looked to me like maybe there's a 1% decline. Well, we're not suffering too badly, I suppose. And uh, today on the, on the university campus, I celebrated a mass for the uh, commemoration of what we call Canadian martyrs, uh, uh, Jesuit priests and brothers that died in the 1600s, late 1600s coming uh, to share the gospel, to share the faith of Christ um, and suffered terribly uh, and, were, uh, and were killed for it. So in, in relation to that constant recollection that we have 
of suffering for the fidelity uh, of, of uh, the practice of our, our love for God, um, numerical decline, increase, it, ju it just kind of pales in comparison uh, to that. Thinking of the downtown area um, and thinking of buildings and what buildings represent, the cathedral's full, it's active, there's lots going on, and I do recall a, a priest coming out from Quebec uh, who was serving to fill in for a, for a priest who was on holiday, uh, just absolutely amazed, thrilled, that so many people were actually coming, uh, coming to uh, the church and coming to Mass. Uh, so things are good as far as worship goes, I would say, the downtown core. Underneath the cathedral uh, is what's called the 910 Club. Uh, it's, it's full. Uh, we've got lots of people down there from the street community that are being regularly served uh, by uh, an army of volunteers and have been for about 40 years with uh, a daily substantial meal that's free of cost. And I meet with them regularly and they're really thrilled. So that, that's going really well. Sisters of St. Anne have been in the, uh, the, the city and the province for a long, long time. Uh, they still oversee Mount St. Mary Hospital, which is full of 200 beds, long-term care. Uh, that's going well, even though the last sister, um, well, there is one more sister who still serves on the staff at the, uh, at the hospital, but their order is in, uh, is in some decline in Canada. Uh, in the city as well, we've got a school, St. Andrew's Elementary School. Uh, it's just in the process of being sold. Uh, so we've had a presence in terms of education, and that school's amalgamating with St. Joe's, so it's part of this demographic shift out into the suburbs. I think that's a bit of a shame and a bit of a loss. Uh, we also have St. Vincent de Paul affiliated with the Catholic Church, which serves social needs of, uh, of people on the streets, low-income housing. Uh, the the, uh, the St. Vincent de Paul oversees um, a housing complex as well. So there's, there's uh, all kinds of things. I think we suffer, um, in, in, in some ways, we suffer a credibility crisis uh, two things come to my mind. Paul, you mentioned it, the, uh, uh, the history of residential schools. Uh, there's a lot of work we need to do to heal uh, and to reconcile and to hear the truth of what went on. So that's a, that's a work in progress. I've been uh, sitting in on healing circles uh, at the University of Victoria First People's House to just try and be part of that. Um, a second thing, of course, that's really affected the uh, credibility of the Catholic Church, which needs to uh, be addressed, answered, and, uh, and, and uh, resolved, uh, is uh, some of our clergy uh, abuse situations. That's ruined, uh, that's ruined our reputation in a terrible way. And so guys like me have to work really, really hard to, uh, to repair some of the damage. And that could be years, decades, uh, decades of work. Uh, so we're live. Uh, we just had World Youth Day down at uh, Rio de Janeiro with the Pope, Pope Francis. Uh, 3.7 million young people gathered on Copacabana Beach and celebrated a closing mass. Uh, we're not going anywhere. We're not dying. Uh, we're pretty happy, actually, for the most part, in spite of it all. We're pretty happy. So thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize the fact that we are gathered here this evening on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people and honor them as, as we gather. And thank you, Paul, for inviting me to be part of it this evening. Um, I've lived with this stuff <laughs> as an Anglican for the last 10 years. And the answer is yes, that's what's happening to us. That's where we're going. Um, we were part of a colonial church we came here um, as part of the colonial government and uh, we were part of the establishment. And there's some sense that we are struggling with that and continue to struggle with that as being Anglicans. There is an um, Indian theologian, his name is Christopher Durasingh, uh, from the Church of North India, who says that we as Anglicans went around the world carrying God on our back, as if the folk that we were meeting in the countries where we colonized, had no concept or no idea of God. And that's something that we um, at the cathedral have been working on and challenged ourselves to look at. Um, that's why we chose the, the tagline for the cathedral as revealing God's presence in the world. And when we do that, we talk about uh, all faiths, all communities, and especially our relationship with First Nations people and experiencing God in that way. In 1968, we had a survey, 
And our diocese is Vancouver Island and the surrounding Gulf Islands. It's called the Diocese of British Columbia, again because we were here at the beginning. But it's actually Vancouver Island and the, the Gulf Islands. And we had a survey which says we had too many churches and not enough people following those, the, following those churches. And we ignored that in 1968. Ten years ago, we had another piece of work where, for my sins, I think, I ended up being the chair of the committee <laughs> who went through all of our parishes. And over the last 10 years, we've seriously looked at the congregations that, that we've had and looked at either closing those congregations or amalgamating them. And I think 10 years ago, we had 56 uh, different congregations on the island. We went out down to just over 45 congregations. So we've closed them. So as I say, we've, we've lived with that. But it is a sense that of, of, of theology. We, we have suffered, and really so, because of our, our involvement in residential schools, of trying to create, for, recreate First Nation people in our own image. We've suffered because of that. And we are in a place now where we, like Dean said, we are having healing circles, and we are part of the Truth and Reconciliation, and we're working through that. But as part of a struggle we've had as Anglicans is to kind of find an identity that is not tied to the establishment. It's not tied to uh, the, the motherland. It's not tied to England. But what does it mean to be Canadian Anglicans? What it means to be Canadian Anglicans for us today is to be a church where women take leadership, where women are ordained, and there's an equality between men and women. What does it mean? It means that, that we're a church that bless uh, same gender relationships. What does it mean? It means that we're a church that's involved in social issues. And so that's how we're responding to where we are. It's a theological issue for us, and we're struggling with that theology as we move into the, the future. To respond to your other, the question about what will happen in a culture, I, I, I have a, I can must be a, an optimistic view of folk. I see um, people throughout whatever tagline they want to put on them as being good people, as being people um, of, of a spirit, people that, that will honour other people. And I want to just end up a good time to end with a story which I think reflects um, humanity. On the street that I live, sounds like a song, doesn't it? On the street that I live, the folk in the neighbourhood, small part of a street, just a block, decided that they no longer wanted to pay the city to mow the boulevards. And so they were going to make application to the city for that money to be returned. The people didn't want that money to be returned to themselves. The folk gathered together and said, who should we help with this money? How should we use this money? Most of the people on the street, the part of the street where I live, would not identify themselves, as far as I could see, as being church members or members of other faith communities. They might fall into savant's uh, group, spiritual but not religious. But they wanted to use that money. We're still waiting for the city of Victoria to respond and send the money to us. But they wanted to use that money to reach out. Not for themselves, not in a self-centered way, but to reach out to the, those indeed within the community. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. Good evening and greetings from First Metropolitan United Church. Uh, uh, Tammy Lindell, who uh, has started out just uh, recently as our halftime spiritual care minister at our congregation, her other halftime work is as the spiritual coordinator for hospice. And she tells me that by far the largest faith group she encounters there is the spiritual but not religious. And uh, I wanted to focus on something just a little different than that, that uh, is catching my attention. I think within that group, there's a significant group that I would call spiritual and a little bit religious. <laughs> and I'm encountering them every week. And uh, that is, as I see situations change, that's uh, something that's catching my attention. Uh, these are people who, uh, are not into big dogma, they're not into uh, a lot of duty and, and uh, shoulds and all the rest of that. They're into following their passion. 
And it seems to me that, that uh, the West Coast has already, always been a bit more individualistic than the rest of Canada. And with some of the developments, technology is encouraging that more and more. When I was growing up, we could sing all evening just Beatles songs that we knew together. But now, you know, you're hooked into your own set of songs to listen to. It's very individualistic. But these individuals who are flying around like little particles, every now and then they cluster around something that's exciting for them, where their passion is. And so that's where I see such phenomena where uh, people, we call them friends of first met. They may go to another faith group, they may have no other faith group whatsoever, but they get together with us when we do an inner city dinner for 250 people. Or they get together with us when we put on a, a major conference or, or when we uh, see that there's a lack uh, in our school system these days and we put on uh, sexual health education and hundreds of people come out for that. Uh, we find that they're willing to partner with us in a whole variety of ways and that's part of our tradition. Before the United Church of Canada was formed in 1925, there were a few thousand union congregations across Canada. And one little village I knew, for instance, they had Quakers, they had Baptists, they had all sorts of folks who said, listen, let's get practical here. Let's work together for the common good in this small community. No sense having our own little uh, uh, fiefdoms or whatever. And, and that was a major part in the movement that created the United Church of Canada in 1925. And so that's part of our heritage at its best, is that type of respect and tolerance and working together towards some shared cause. So uh, we do that in, in a variety of ways. Um, for instance, we uh, partnered with uh, Will Weigler uh, and a, a group that were putting together some community drama based on the book Unsettling the Settler Within and created this wonderful community drama on what do, uh, do we do as settler citizens of Canada in response to residential schools. And Judge Murray Sinclair had invited Will then to give a presentation in Vancouver just last week on that. But those sorts of partnerships really excite me and we don't have to be front center on it but we're looking for ways in which we can partner. We're partnering with jazz musicians right now on a series of music and reflections. Uh, we're partnering uh, with some doctors that approached us this week to see about uh, a special series they offer now on relaxation exercises for people facing various forms of stress. Uh, so it's, that is sort of a continuation of looking for the common good in, in the community. Uh, certainly, Many of my colleagues at times, I'm sure they feel like they're managers of uh, BlackBerry. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's changes going on for sure, huge changes. And, and I find both within our core and the people on the edge of our congregation, one of the key changes I see is it's not that loyalist group anymore. There's not the brand identity. What they're looking for is something that truly excites them. We have a, a member of our congregation who's been uh, about her third time to Africa and there for several months working with uh, orphans because of HIV AIDS. She's not there out of a sense of duty. It's because it's her passion. And so we're looking for ways to, to team up with other communities and seeing where do we have some shared vision and we can work together on this. Uh, one of our long-term partners uh, has been the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria, which is housed in our building and has been for uh, over 15 years. We're talking with them very seriously and with the Victoria, uh, Greater Victoria Housing Society about the opposite end from our sanctuary, how we might redevelop that area. Uh, and again, we don't have to be front center about that, but we're looking to work for the common good. And I think. Uh, for various traditional faith groups to be looking for those folks, the spiritual and a little religious, you'll be quite amazed at some of the partnerships you can forge. Thank you. All right, so now we have a chance for you guys to pose any questions uh, you might like to pose. I have a mic. I don't know that I'll be able to get around the whole audience, but uh, if you speak loudly enough, I'll make sure that uh, it gets to the right person. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Scott. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, you might want to venture a 
hypothesis on the uh, gyration with the conservative Protestants. Um, and dude, where's your, where's your Pentecostal on the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I thought a panel of six was, was plenty big. And uh, well, OK, so the, some theories about the Pentecostals or, or the conservative Protestants. Which, which one do you want to know about? Uh, uh, okay. okay, so um, as it happens, just coincidentally, I'm, I'm reviewing a book right now for U of T Press about that exact issue, because this fellow noticed that uh, the numbers went down, but he saw quite a lot of health in his communities. Um, so he did an ethnographic study of a number of, of uh, churches in southern Ontario. And what he found was that um, there were a lot of people in these churches that you and I would recognize as Pentecostal. They look like Pentecostals, they sing like Pentecostals, they speak in tongues like Pentecostals, but the people don't think of themselves as Pentecostals. The church doesn't have the word Pentecostal in, in the name anymore. And so a lot of those folks, they're actually in what you and I would call Pentecostal churches, but they wouldn't say that. So that's, that's how he explained the dip. So it refers to this kind of uh, delabeling of this uh, category. Lynn, you had a question. Um, yeah, you talked about how 24% of Canadians are, are, say they have more religion. I just wonder if you want to comment on that, that in British Columbia, that number is actually 44%, as you know. Yep. It does make us quite different, even if part of that is spiritual, but not Absolutely. Yep, good. Thank you. Um, so two things on it, I would say. The, the figure of, of about 20 to 25% is pretty common in a number of, of um, liberal democratic societies in, in the world. Um, but then within each society, you'll have regions that are that sort of skew that somewhat. So, uh, so you're right, BC has a, has a disproportionate number of those folks. And in fact, if you looked at it by, by age, you'd see it even higher. Certainly, I would think under 40, uh, you probably have, you know, in the 60s, 60% 60 range too. So, I mean, and, and your own work has reflected on this issue too, and I think Alan might have mentioned this toward the end, that there is something about this place that has tended to uh, attract people who are more uh, oriented toward a kind of a experiential or an experimental form of, of spirituality, if they're oriented toward spirituality at all, or oriented toward, you know, issuing the category altogether. So, yeah, you're right. Terry. Yes, uh, are there any examples of um the, the church is represented here, uh, and the faith represented here, working together or even talking about working together to address social renewal. When you say social renewal, what do you, what do you mean? In the city, the, we're talking about the urban situation. So to what extent are some of the urban issues being addressed in an interfaith, with interfaith initiative. Alan? Uh, our congregation years ago gave birth to an organization called the Open Door, which has morphed into Our Place. And Don Evans, the new director there, is doing remarkable work. And something I know is that he has engaged a variety of faith groups. I know the synagogue's been involved and so forth uh, in participating in the, the good work of uh, our place. So that's one, one great example. And uh, Logan and I invite you to hear John Bell next week, <laughs> next month. But so, so we're looking at some, some part ways of partnering. But I would say something like our place is, is a key example because uh, our place is for all, all of us to support, you know, whether we're of any faith group or no faith group. Just add, um, Alan talked about John Bell coming, but we've tr we've tried to work at what you said is what does it mean to work along Quarter Street? <coughs> along Quarter Street, it might be the highway to heaven for Victoria, um, <laughs> because you have First Met, you have St John's Quadra, and you have the Cathedral, the Anglican Cathedral. And how do we work together? We've been trying to do that and, and work together on social issues. John Bell is just a, one of those issues. Yeah. I'd like to give you a little bit of a different perspective. I come from a generation that uh, lives by the song Imagine. There's no heaven, there's no hell. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about uh, spiritual non-religious, it's so easy to go to that place because I see the phenomenal work that's being done. It's, it's you know, our society, I really don't think could uh, exist without it. But it's the Salvation Army. It's, it's every one of these organizations. And, 
if we could find some way to work together, I think what will happen is the generation that I happen to come from will be more inclined to move in something that is leads you down a path, let's say, rather than is totally open. So I just wonder how you deal with, like, my generation, we say, imagine, there is no... For those of you who can't see him, he's, he's in his early 40s. <laughs> so, uh... Well, nothing really comes to mind in the sense, I, I, I appreciate the sentiment though, that it's a more fluid way, is that what you're saying, a more fluid way of engaging with maybe a, a consciousness around social justice? Like, like I was raised Catholic and then I became Mormon and then I'd be, I, I, I researched a lot of different ways to go. And this way is just so simplistic because it's internal, it's yeah. not external. And, and so why do you, can I just ask you a question, why do you find that so much easier than perhaps going to a group that's setting up those structures and, and, and engaging in their communities? You know, it, and it's not to say that the Bible isn't written or when it was transcribed it was changed or whatever book happens to be. But as someone said today, you know, as soon as you started, the Jewish lady, as soon as you start putting in writing, there becomes a, and writing in itself is a very left brain activity, it's a patriarchal activity. Here we are, we're, this is the way to do it. But it's not the way to do it. Neurobiology is teaching us. We have trillions of these things in our brains, and all of a sudden, we're understanding that we're so complex. So, so not to be negative to anybody, it's just, uh, you're phenomenal what you do, but there's a bigger picture there, I think. As for the individual, So, uh, the writing down, I think, is an interesting phenomenon to look at because as with everything, there's negatives and there's positives. You know, the, what I was referring to was Mishnah being written down. So Jewish law, after the destruction of the temple, if it wasn't written down, would have been lost. Like all memory would have been lost. So there's a place in the culture where you have no option. If you're the minority, you're the threatened minority, there's hardly any of you left, and you have a few who remember the culture, what option do you have but to write it down, right? But then where do we go with those written traditions? And I think it's a real question for, for a lot of Jews today, is how do we take those written traditions that used to be taught in a much more oral fashion. It's this play between oral and written. I had a conversation with a First Nations woman up at UVic, and she was very involved in writing down her language. She was one of the last speakers of her language, and it was very important that it be written down to save the language. And I said, we did that too. She said, I know, I've been to Israel 12 times. And I always come back and I say, if the Jews could do it, so can we, right? So, so there's a place where writing it down is tremendously important. It's that collective memory. How do we apply the collective memory within each individual story? That's our challenge. Yes, please. Um, I have uh, kind of two unrelated questions. Um, one might apply more for the uh, various Christian uh, uh, representatives here. Um, one of you alluded to uh, uh, the fact that a lot of church land uh, is potentially being, kept, being sold off. Um, and I was wondering, I, I don't, unfortunately I don't know the context too well, of how uh, church finances are in various different denominations considering the decline in membership in some cases, and whether that land is uh, generally intentionally being sold for uh, uh, social service uh, issues such as lower income housing or the like uh, in, in line with the, your values or if you're feeling compelled <coughs> to uh, sell to a higher bidder for uh, because of uh, those constraints and how that might make you feel. And the other question I had was, um, uh, more for you concerning, uh, you mentioned that uh, kind of the increase in uh, conservative Christian denominations and the decrease in liberal ones. I was wondering if there was any comparable data for non-Christian religions. 
Yeah, I try to share that. They're they're all growing. Um, or uh, in terms of political orientation. Oh, uh, no, I don't believe we have that data, actually. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't even want to speculate on that. I mean, really, th many of the folks that we're talking about here are really first generation, probably 80, 70, 80% of the Muslim Hindu Sikh communities are first, first generation folks. And so they have a different set of concerns. They're, you know, many of them are, are sort of survive, just trying to survive and get their kids uh, integrated well into schools and careers and so forth. So it, we'll have to sort of, uh, in order to, to you know, compare and contrast them in a meaningful way with the, the more established uh, if you will, white churches, and Protestant ones especially, we'll have to let them integrate for longer to be able to do that. But, but by that point, um, many of the uh, existing churches will be in a um, much more uh, strained situation, I think. But your first question, could you just recap the question? Because I think, yeah, we'll be that. I'll try and respond to the question because I said about us uh, selling off church property. And we've done that over the last number of years. Um, and we've also moved out of some of our property and we rent that property to other, uh, other uh, faith communities as well. So the conversation we're in at the moment is a conversation exactly that relates to your question. It's what do we do with that money that we get from these places? Um, part of the problem is we're in a major transition at the moment, major change. And because of, because of um, income and, and offerings going down, uh, and because of some things, I speak for, just for the Diocese of British Columbia, um, because of some mistakes we've made in the past with our finances, we needed to use some of that money to get us back on level ground, right? To pay off some debt we had to ourselves, some money that we used. But there is some ideas that are coming out where a portion of that money, uh, we've called it new wine ministry, uh, new initiatives, that will go back into those communities and be used for, for, to do church differently. Uh, to work at church systems. and I've just been around the diocese to most of the regions in the diocese and the things that comes up more and more and more is the social aspect of the church like social housing, ministry with seniors and children. One of the things that we lost uh, was selling off the properties um, or the communities lost was daycares, places for Alcoholics Anonymous or 12-step programs to meet, uh, places for um, community groups to meet. That's what we, we let go. Along with the buildings, we lost that, and, and those communities lost that as well. And how do we regain that, that involvement within those communities? Sorry, I've got one more question. Okay, sorry, just return. Sure. It's yours. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. You want to direct that to anybody? Uh, anybody can speak to that. <laughs> You're all married. <laughs> <laughs> all of us all do. All right, I'll jump in there. I think uh, in terms of Judaism, for a single person to be a member of the synagogue or the shul, or, I, I think it's much harder. I think everything is very much directed to families. A lot of Jews don't even consider joining a synagogue until they have children themselves. You know, I've seen surveys where uh, single Jews have been interviewed about joining a synagogue, and there's like, like, why would I do that? I don't have kids. So it's, you know, I mean, but that, that is the reality that, that I'm speaking to. Um, and, and so I think it's a huge issue that, that Jews are beginning to look at. I think there's no question coming to the floor here where Jews haven't asked of other Jews. You know, the, the whole idea of 50% out marriage and assimilation are huge, huge issues 
uh, for an already minority group. And then when we stigmatize people within that group, we, you know, we're just exacerbating the problem. I think it's a huge issue. It's a very important issue for here in Victoria, single women. It's a huge demographic here. Uh, in fact, you can go into synagogue before they started counting women in the minyan in the sort of requisite required number of 10 to proceed. If you didn't count the women, you were really stuck because it was the women who were coming to the services and often many of those women were single. So it, it's a real social, religious, political is issue with all manner of ramifications if you're dealing with a, a larger legal framework that questions the very participation of women. So, what, what comes to my mind is, the, is just simply the fact the Latin tradition of the, of the Catholic Church uh, has a high regard for the celibate state and people who uh, sense a call to priesthood uh, or to religious life. And so increasingly we pray for vocation, for priests, for religious, but also for people who are called to the single lay state, uh, for married people, for families. Um, that doesn't necessarily translate into uh, community instantly for the single person, lay person in the community, uh, but, but it's, it's an expectation in our prayer uh, and in, uh, in our efforts at ministry to sort of include everybody in the wider family of, of the church. Whether we do it very well or not is another question. So, uh, Ruben, if I, just by way of, of closing, uh, there are some of my undergraduate students here who are considering the possibility of writing a paper on the basis of this kind of uh, conversation. And if, if I was one of you, I would say that some of the things I've heard is especially um, with you three guys, the whole question of the legacy of residential schools, all three of you mentioned it, I, I mentioned it, it's a really important uh, fact that you're grappling with. Also the question of what's happening with um, the younger generation is a really you know, challenging fact you're dealing with. And also, uh, Lynn, you mentioned the issue of legacy with, with respect to the Shoah and how to understand contemporary Judaism uh, kind of in the shadow of the Shoah. And the question of prejudice about SBR folks being superficial, narcissistic, and not contributing to society, and Muslims you know, struggling with many stereotypes that, that you have to struggle with. You know, I, I, I guess those are the, would be the themes I would see as kind of running through your, your, uh, your talks this evening. And um, I would just like to thank City Talks and uh, thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, the next, um, I should say, hang on. I have a screen that gives you some information on that. There are four talks. Um, these are the next talks in the center, and this final one is the, is the next City Talks lecture, which will be here uh, at 7.30 with my colleague Anik Charmin from uh, Montreal. So please join us for that, and if you want to come out next Thursday to the university, we have our regular uh, Thursday lecture series then. Okay, I'll hand it over to Ruben. All right, well, uh, I was just going to ask us to thank Paul and the panelists, but you've already done that. Uh, I was also going to mention the next talk in the series, which is on October 24th. Uh, Paul's already done that as well. So uh, if you'd like any additional information, you can uh, find us on, uh, online at thecitytalks.ca, uh, the website, as well as on Facebook. Uh, so thank you all for coming, uh, and I think this will really uh, set a nice tone for the rest of the, uh, the lectures this, this term. So. Thanks a lot. Have a good